And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PreneurCast. You know, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Don Gosher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if you want to. Visit us online at PreneurMarketing.com. Hello, hello, hello. Pete Williams here along with my trusty pal Dom Gatcher for this week's PreneurCast episode. How you doing? Hello, everyone, and welcome. How's things, mate? Pretty good, pretty good, as usual. Um, I, yeah, well, I almost talked about the weather then. <laughs> this week, we have an awesome conversation with Dr. Jason Fox, author of the book The Game Changer, and the man with the best beard in marketing, I think. I, I can't disagree with you on that, looking at the photograph on his website. It's quite a spectacular feat of facial accoutrement. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, uh, we'll get into that in a moment, but uh, as usual, what's uh, been happening in your week, mate? What's been going on in the world of Dom? Uh, really just carrying on with the stuff I talked about last week. I, I hate to be boring, but I'm doing the serial versus parallel. I'm sticking with my main projects. Um, Very cool. Developing uh, the consulting business and uh, that little uh, other sideline that, uh, that I've hinted at. That's still not got itself off the ground yet, so it's not really something I'm going to talk about. But when it does, it's going to be quite interesting because, as I said, um, it's a complete break from everything that, I've got anything to do with about. I've got. I know nothing about the topic at all. I'm just bringing the marketing chops. Um, so it's it's quite an interesting little thing. What about yourself? Uh, I've just been working on a whole bunch of uh, essays and getting my writing on. Uh, so you know, make sure you do check out preneurmarketing.com. Uh, not only are the show notes for all the episodes we have here on Preneurcast there, but uh, we're ramping up the actual writing side of things. So there's uh, been a couple of good essays on there recently. One with. Uh, David Jay, who listeners uh, would be familiar with, I talk about him a lot. He's did a, a fantastic backlinking strategy last year that would absolutely still work today. So we kind of broke that down as a case study. Uh, the If I Was series that we occasionally do here on the show is being extended into short essays uh, on the blog, and we've got a whole bunch of other really cool stuff coming out, book excerpts and uh, guest posts and, um, yeah, a lot of really cool evidence-based data-driven, swipe-and-deploy uh, essays uh, are coming out in the blog. So we're really trying to lift that publishing process uh, over there. So there's going to be some really cool stuff that's worth reading, sharing, subscribing to, all that kind of good stuff. You are absolutely just amazing, turning out an amazing amount of content, but the quality, I have to say, is quite fantastic. I love the Davy J backlinking thing. I know we're not all about online, uh, and there are you know, there's loads of different avenues and aspects of, of the business and marketing process that you cover there on Premier Marketing. But the David J thing was pretty cool. He's a clever guy, isn't he? He's very smart. And there's some other stuff he's done recently, which I was begging him to let me share, but he uh, wanted to keep them a little bit closer to his chest. So hopefully I can twist his arm in a couple of months' time and release some other sort of case studies of stuff he's done. But speaking of that, if anyone who listens to the show has done uh, a really cool marketing tactic, a way to increase any one of their levers or have done something really, really cool, want some free exposure, want a really good SEO backlink, uh, then reach out to us via support at preneurgroup.com and we would love to share what you've done in your business. We want it to be data-driven, so we want screenshots and before and afters and analytics data and anything you can prove that this is sort of what we did and this is the results we got. Uh, we would love to share your story uh, on the site and we've got a whole bunch of uh, community case studies already set, ready to go and we'd love to plug yours into that, that list as well. So uh, hit us up if you've done something really cool, whether it's you've done something to increase your opt-in rate on your website, you did a split test and something worked, whether you did a really cool Kickstarter launch, whether you um, have done a really good negotiation with a supplier or you wrote a book and you did a really cool tactic to promote it, let us know about one single thing you've done really well that you'd love to share that we can talk about with the community and help them grow their businesses as well because that's the whole idea of this uh, preneur community is to sort of help each other out. Absolutely. Uh, just uh, say that email address again, please, Pete. Uh, support at preneurgroup.com. Excellent. So do drop us a line about that, folks, because uh, we would love to share your successes with the rest of the community. So, as usual, Pete, I'm going to ask you uh, if you've been listening to or even reading a particular book this week. 
Yeah, a few books obviously hit my table regularly and, uh, you know, the bigger we get, the more people send us books, which is nice. And one of them, uh, which actually came from a friend of mine, Mark Mido, who's an Australian uh, entrepreneur here in Melbourne, is a book called The Five Minute Business. And it's uh, it's his book breaking down how to sort of start a business that can you can run in sort of five minutes. And it's an interesting book. There's a lot of really good takeaways in there. Uh, I'm featured in it as well, which obviously makes it a great book. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but there was actually one chapter that I was reading that gave me a very different perspective on content marketing. And there'll be a blog up on the site, uh, possibly by the time you're listening to this, about that because I've had this issue with content marketing. So it doesn't really fit my framework for uh, you know marketing a business, which a lot of people know who listen to the show is the preneur hierarchy and make sure you go back and listen to that episode. And I've always felt content marketing has been a, a way to reach procrastinators and ignorance uh, when it comes to that framework. And I kind of thought, look, you are better off you know, trying to reach the searches um, in that framework. If these sort of terms aren't making sense, make sure you go back and listen to that episode because it really is important. But one of the things that Mark mentions in one of the chapters is a way to look at content marketing that I hadn't really looked at before. So I've convinced him to let me rip that chapter out, put it as a uh, guest or blog post slash book excerpt, which is uh, coming in the last next couple of days, just getting some typos fixed and commas put into the essay, uh, and it'll be up on the site. So if you want to get a preview of his book, um, read something that sort of surprised me uh, and find out more about it, then, uh, yeah, check out the blog in the next couple of days or when you are listening to this, there's probably a good chance it'll be up there on the on the site. Cool. And that's really great, actually, that uh, we're now getting uh, book excerpts from authors on uh, preneurmarketing.com as well. So yeah. do check that out. And I'll put a link to the book, the full book, in the show notes anyway. That's a five-minute business by Mark mm. Middow, right? Absolutely. Cool. So I'm, I'm kind of pushing this forward because... <laughs> I'm really going to sound like a stock record here, but this year you are just going all out with these interviews that you're finding, these authors that you're finding, that not only are they really, really interesting subject matter, but there's a thread at the moment, which is that they're things that I wouldn't normally have, like I would never have picked this book up. Mm. Okay. I would, Dr. Jason Fox, author of The Game Changer, okay, but the first thing... When you mentioned it to me, and the first thing I thought was gamification. Mm-hmm. And I hate that term. <laughs> I can't stand the concept as it's been presented in the popular media. I think it's a right load of tosh. I've got no ties. I'm, I'm, I'm like that, like you are with content marketing. Yep. All right? And so I'm just, I was, I had no hope that this was going to be a good interview. At all, um, and one of the one of my favourite parts of the whole thing is where he says, "I hate that term too." <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's absolutely. I mean, again, he's he's written this book, uh, which you know we'll talk about in the interview. But there's so many other things that you you get him to talk about, and he's got such a huge range of knowledge, and his perspective is really really interesting on a lot of different things that are totally relevant to the preneur community. So well, just, this, this is the thing. His doctorate is in motivation. Yeah. That's that's where his doctorate came from. He's a doctor of motivation, which sounds like a hyper little sort of sub-line some 1990s um, motivational stage speaker would have used, a doctor of motivation, but he actually has one. It's official. He is officially the doctor of motivation. Wow. But, and, and he does talk a lot about that in this interview. Uh, motivating both yourself and teams and things like that so it's but there's just so many other things in it so i'm just going to get out of the way um and folks really really this is it's a little it's a bit longer than the usual but definitely worth the time so have a listen to pete talking to dr jason fox author of the game changer all right jason so i've got one question this is probably going to be the one you get asked the most before we delve too much into all of this and that is, how do you look after such a magnificent beard? Ah, uh, oh, that's great. I'm so relieved that it's not that uh, what does the fox say question. I've been getting <laughs> that so much recently and it's just, I, I try to pl- do a polite laugh just, to, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the beard, right. Um, yeah, well, how, how does that happen? Oh, gosh. Um, 
Yeah, I'm trying desperately to think of something cool. Um, but the reality is there's this Etsy thing that my wife put me on to, which is like this beard conditioning thing made by hippies over in the other uh, side of the planet. Awesome. And it's magic, yeah. You just, you just kind of you look after it. You wash it every couple of days because with beards and like eggs benedict and all sorts of things, like it's tricky. Tricky, yeah. Interesting. I <laughs> so, love it, mate. Love it. So on more serious topics though, sure. The Game Changer, the new book, it's very exciting. Yeah, it is actually. It's oh, you've and you've published books. It's it's this weird mix of emotions, you know, having this this book out because because there's this part of me, but the whole book is about progress um, and helping people drive progress and change and and always kind of be leveling up in in, in the work that they do. Um, but now that it's captured in the book, and there's just there's even more ideas that I want to share. But this book is here, and uh, yeah, it's this weird mix of things. It's, it's exciting. It's I mean, it hasn't hit the shelves at the time of recording. It hasn't hit the shelves, but that's going to happen very very soon. Um, yeah, it's it's. So it's be I, I want to ask you a bit about this because I was watching sure. um, one of your TED talks, I think from the Melbourne Uni one from a couple of years ago. And oh, gosh. I don't know if you, if you remember this, but in the conversation or the presentation you have you said if i was going to write a book about all this it would have one word work now i've had a galley version of this book and i've read it and there's more than one word in it you, you just uh, sort of yeah gone a lot yeah, more the deep and then just the word kind of, work yeah, that's they, right. they demand words don't know these publishers it's strange that's, yeah, that's right they have these little, yeah uh, i i think that i think that and that's in the context of of the secret to success and um I did a PhD in motivation science and I'm a fairly introverted guy but I've had a fairly unhealthy level of exposure to motivational speakers <laughs> and um, there is so much hype and fist pumping rah-rah and fluff and folklore out there that just doesn't correlate to to science or even just reason. Um, it feels good, it sounds good but I just got frustrated with all this glossing over the fact that you know if we want to make stuff happen it's a lot of non-linear failure rich work. Um, and instead of trying to get around it or ignore the fact or outsmart it, like just cheat it, I think we need to get smarter with how we work and make the work bit work. And that comes from redesigning work. Um, I mean, that, 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 that was kind of inspired by this. Um, I, I don't even know if this is true, but I heard it, and it's a great story, and this is always how I preframe it. Um, apparently, Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian guy, was once rumored to have been paid forty or sixty thousand dollars to speak for five minutes at a conference on his secrets to success, and this is a conference paid uh, with big ticket prices, paid by lots of business people who sat there and listened to these secrets. And anyway, he's introduced. Uh, here's Jerry Seinfeld sharing the secrets to success, and he went up to a flip chart. He wrote three words. He nodded, and then he left. And those three words were "do the work." <laughs> and I think there's this. It's it's a little bit un. Uh, it's a little bit anticlimactic and some sense but i think it's where we need to bring the focus back to particularly in the context of motivation uh, absolutely and but this is the question is like how do you do the work and i guess you know that's the whole context uh, and obviously the content of the book and i really want to get into that because what you talk about quite a bit is i guess the game gamification is that probably the, a bit of a, a, a buzzword yeah. but is that kind of gamification of stuff to actually make you present because i think one of the things you talk about quite a bit and this is i guess where i'd love to take this conversation is that sure you know, people will sit and play Candy Crush for mm. five hours straight and yeah. do that over and over again. But if they could just build the habit of sitting down for an hour every day, working on that book, working on that mm -hmm. startup, working on that yeah. idea, it's going to have much more success in their, in their life, you know, more substantial and material impact. So yeah. what is it about things like Candy Crush that, make, that is addictive that make people do that kind of quote-unquote work compared yeah. to real work? Yeah, I mean, and that's that's the very question that um, has fascinated me, and, and that that for me started when I was when I was doing my research and teaching people how to set goals at the time and all the classic motivational strategies, and yet I was playing a lot of World of Warcraft, which was a very popular, massively multiplayer yep. uh, role playing game at the time. Uh, it displaced all the other motivational constructs I had, and um, I did a conference recently, uh, and. Uh, someone admitted that on the flight over, about 80% of the staff were playing Candy Crush uh, on the flight over. And these are all intelligent people um, <laughs> who are at some level are aware that it's probably not the wisest investment of time. But Candy Crush, you look at games like that, and if you actually get curious, it's, it's, most people stop and uh, they, they just excuse it. They say it's just escapism. Um, people are playing video games like that because they want to escape. Um, 
And then what, what I get curious about is to what, they, what are they escaping from? Because what usually happens is uh, if you look at games, like even sports games like golf, um, if it was simply about achieving the goals and getting a sense of reward, uh, then you could just walk up to any golf hole and take your shot, you know, an inch from the hole and, and you'd be winning. But games have rules that make it difficult. And this is, this is so important. And it's, it's something that's often missed when people talk about gamification. Games are essentially well-designed work. And people play games because they want to engage with well-designed work, work that makes them, gives them a sense of achievement and a sense of progress. And so Candy Crush, you know, does that. The, the feedback loops are tight and immediate. So any effort you invest into it, you get, you get feedback as to how you're progressing. Um, you've got a sense of mastery. You can see your growth. You can see how your skills are developing. They calibrate the level of challenge. So it's never so ridiculously challenging that you feel anxious and want to avoid the task. And, and, and it's also not, not so boring and easy for you that, um, you get disengaged. Like they get the level just right. And that puts us into a state of flow where we lose sense of time. And I mean, that's the same type of experience that people have when they play some sport games or when they do art or cook or uh, play golf or other things like that. So there's lots of factors there, but all of, all of these things are motivation design elements that we can take and apply to real world stuff, back to meaningful projects and meaningful work. And that's where I attempt to at least, um, you know, unpack some of the things that might work and, and an approach that might work for people in real world work. Very cool. I remember reading one of the passages in the book or one of the things I listened to over, over the years was you saying that technically motivation isn't the problem. And I found this really enlightening because obviously, you know, no doubt people who are listening to this have been to motivational seminars like we all have and heard that mm. rah, rah type of stuff. And there is some value to it, I believe, to a certain extent. But mm. the one thing you said which really stuck with me was motivation isn't the problem because if you are you know, sitting on the couch watching TV, you are 100% motivated to do that yeah. action. Yeah. And after that was really cool to sort of think and stop and go, okay, yeah, like we're always motivated. It's just what we're motivated to do, which mm -hmm. is the issue. And sometimes you're kind of avo avoiding certain types of things. Um, that's... Exactly. Yeah. So... Um, and, and, and like to put this in context, and, and you're right, the rah-rah stuff is really good. Like... Um, it, let's 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 make the distinction between inspiration, which is the stimulation to to feel or think differently um, about something, which then needs to convert into aspiration, which then translate into the motivation to actually make stuff happen. Now, once we get to the point where you have a goal or an intention or a purpose or something you want to achieve, it gets a little bit counterproductive to focus on motivation too much. Um, and traditionally, the, what people will do is they'll go in and they'll start questioning attitudes and beliefs and values and goals and visions and dreams and all this internal stuff. Whereas instead, if we just park this concept of motivation and just assume all of us are 100% motivated all the time, if, if people aren't engaging in the behavior that we want them to, or if, you, if we're not finding that we do what we, you know, what we actually have a goal to do or what we, what we intend to do or what's good for our business, then we just get curious and we look at like what, what's happening in the environment. Like what is the level of challenge at? Is it that we need to break this task down into smaller steps or is it that it's so mundane and boring that we need to compress uh, the amount of time we spend on it and do a productivity blitz and just ninja through it in, you know, an hour? Is it because between where anyone is and where, where we, or between where we are and where we want to be, there's always a whole heap of friction, like stuff mm -hmm. that just gets in the way. Um, and if we can work on removing the friction or at least limiting that and then calibrating the challenge and probably most importantly, getting a sense of progress or a sense, um, uh, and that, that, I mean, this correlates to the number one breakthrough idea from the Harvard Business Review 2010. That progress is one of the most powerful motivators. It's, it's why people will often default to checking email or Facebook or things like that. It's because these things, you know, at, you know, you've got, you've got lots of important things to do, but hey, you've got 60 emails in your inbox and then, an hour later, you've only got 12, you, you know, you're winning. And, and that's, that's, that's yep. exactly, and that's the sense that we get to. So our, our activities will often default to the environments that give us the richest sense of progress. Um, most of our procrastination efforts, uh, you know, some people have this thing of tidying up their desk or checking emails or, um, or I have a friend who procrastinates, um, so she'll bake cupcakes and just watch the progress of that happening. 
And all of these things give you a sense of progress. And that's often what's missing. It's the number one thing that's missing in a lot of our projects. The, the, the feedback loops are way too delayed. And then you look back at games and you're getting a sense of progress immediately as you're doing things. Mm, and and I, was, I was going to say the feedback loops. You mentioned that before and love yeah. to sort of talk about that for sure. That's obviously where you're going. So apologies for interrupting you. Oh, no, that's <laughs> fantastic. You're good. I'm glad, I'm glad I'm on the right track. I, I tend to go on these like little rambles. So so jump in at any time. Um, yeah, the I mean, the simplest hack, the simplest motivational hack that you can do is write a list of things to do. Um, it's so powerful that sometimes people will write down things that they've already done just to tick it off and give themselves a sense of progress of what they've achieved. There's, there's more steps to that, but at its core thing, like you can start your day with a game in mind. Here's the game plan. Um, and then it's a whole bunch of things to do. If we want to elevate that up, you can distinguish what are your mission critical things and what are just other things that you might want to do. And then, and then this is where lists sometimes uh, become a little bit crippling for people because we've been taught to prioritise our lists. Uh, and what usually happens for most people is they have, you know, a whole heap of things on their lists with, that are all high priority uh, and it gives them this sense of anxiety and overwhelm. Um, so what's, what's, what's good at that point is then to start sequencing it out over, over the week to work on the right things at the right time. And, and what we're doing here is just building a bit of a game for ourselves that we can calibrate very quickly. And that gives us a sense of progress as we're moving through it. This is just a very, very basic example, but the list is like the, it's one of the simplest motivational hacks that we can have. So it, that, that's, it's the game plan almost. It's the, you've got to save the princess and that's each, each task is saving the princess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, or at least uh, leveling up to save the princess. Exactly, yes. And if we look at, um, uh, here's an interesting thing, right, because most of us have come from uh, a world of motivation where, um, where goal setting or, and a focus on goals has been overemphasized. And more research is emerging now that says that we need to focus more on the process rather than the results. And it's very important in an entrepreneurial perspective as well because, uh, you know, there's te assumptions to be tested. There's all sorts of changing elements in the market and, and things like that. But the process and the activity and the investment in the system is what's going to make a difference. Um, there's interesting research. And I, I come from a background of teaching goal setting. And, you know, I used to think it was the bee's knees until I, um, you know, until I discovered that everyone talks about it, but very people, few people actually do set smart goals, uh, and it, and they work they work wonderful, wonderfully well for formulaic tasks with predictable outcomes. But for more innovative things, creative things, aspirational things, they're not not so good. And even for some of the more formulaic th things, like uh, sometimes having a focus on goals and good intentions can detract from the inherent joy of an, of an activity. Okay. They did some research with uh, bicycle uh, riders, marathon bike riders, you know, people who ride long distances. Uh, one group was focused on their goals and the other focused just on enjoying the ride. Uh, the ones that focused just on enjoying the ride trained more often and performed better than the ones that focused on achieving uh, the goals. Uh, just because the the goal focused ones didn't enjoy the task and therefore weren't as likely to invest the effort into ongoing training sessions. Mm. That's, that's very interesting. So, not, not, not to say that goals aren't an important component, they're just often overemphasized. So what can we do then to actually, you know, I think one of the things you, you say as well is that, you know, the house always wins, so you have yeah. to be the person designing the game, so it's, you're playing in your house. So what, what are some of these things, you know, with, along with the, the two lists and stuff like that that can actually, you know, increase that feedback loop, you know, have the right challenges, work on the mastery that you spoke about and kind of, Ga gamify our, our lives that, that's the challenging mm. thing for a lot of people is they all want you know i want to write a book i yeah. want to create a product i want to do abc i want to write a, a bunch of blog posts whatever it might be and obviously I think the biggest friction point is the getting your bum in the chair and doing it and you know yeah you read a lot of sort of what stephen king says and all these you know authors like i just have the same time i turn up every day and write and that's all well and good but that's not a fun game <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and, and this is, I, I, I cringe at, you know, one size fits all uh, things and, you know, that turning up every day, you know, might work for some people, um, but for the rest of us, it probably doesn't work so well. But generally, there are some approaches that we can take. And uh, this comes back to um, rituals and structures, um, rituals being almost sacred like routines that that you have and and the very the very basic ritual that we, we we should all try to incorporate or strive to incorporate is at least a weekly check-in 
Mm-hmm. And this is where we check into some sort of structure or some sort of game plan. Now, uh, I'm not a huge fan of New Year's resolutions, um, but I, I, I do like the concept of every year having one word that we focus on as an overarching context or theme. Ooh, a word. I like that. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll talk more about that in a tick. Um, but b- beneath that word, um, you know, we've got, th- we've got four quarters in a year. Every 90 days, I think it's wise and it's a good level for us to be choosing three projects that matter. No less, no more, but three projects that matter that will help to move us forward. Uh, these are the types of things that otherwise wouldn't get done unless we had some conscious structure around them. So many of us will do great things anyway, but there are always projects that, that get shelved or slide or it's always a good idea, but the timing's never right. To get really conscious and almost to set quarterly resolutions around three projects that matter every 90 days, it's a good level of focus for teams as well as individuals. Now, with these projects, uh, having a, a project is different to a, a, a goal. A goal could be an intention, I want to get fitter, I want to get healthier. Um, a project is a very specific thing, like I want to run a marathon. A goal is I want to learn how to cook or something like that or want to cook better. A uh, project is uh, at the end of the month I'm going to host a dinner party uh, and cook a dish from six Spanish regions or something like that. And so we think about these projects that matter each quarter and we take an approach that's that's very experimental. We, there's, there's part of us that needs to be kind of above and detached from the games that we're playing. So by this I, m- I mean that uh, and I saw, saw you shared a um, tweet on Twitter earlier today. We, we need to separate ourselves from our methodology. Mm. And when stuff isn't working, we don't internalize that failure. We get curious as to why it may, may not be working. And then we'll just try to find a new path. And in each quarter out of these three projects, you might fail half of them. And that's fine because uh, failure is not the opposite of success ne- necessarily. The opposite of success is actually apathy because if you're failing properly, you're actually doing stuff and you're learning and you're getting results that you can actually use to grow uh, and learn from. So having a ritual that then checks in with these projects uh, in the context of one word for a year and then having some structures that will help you manage the tasks each day will really keep the game present for you. So as an individual, uh, each day it would be great for you to have a task manager or uh, at least some sort of diary or journal or some sort of daily process that might only be five minutes over breakfast where you identify your mission-critical actions that you're going to do, little teeny bite-sized actions that are going to move you forward on your one of your three projects. Uh, and then every week on a Sunday, you check in with, you know, how you're tracking. If it's not really getting in, if something's messing up the game, you kind of get curious and you go up to that whole level where you almost see yourself playing this game. It's like you zoom out and you can see where you are. And if anything needs calibrating or if stuff's getting in the way or you're not doing it, you just get curious from a motivation design perspective and you think, what are the elements I can tweak that will make this work better for the next week? And the games continue, projects go by, quarters go by, years go by. And it's that type of approach that incorporates a bit of agility but keeps things progressive without locking it into very specific, long-dated plans. I hope that ramble made sense. No, I think, I think definitely it's about that momentum kind of thing is fundamental, what you're saying. So there's a feedback loop built in yeah. daily and weekly and that momentum, which I guess is why things like Lyft, the iPhone app has been totally. so successful because you are checking in regularly and you see that green line progressing. You don't want to break the, the pattern of yeah. progress and things like that. Yeah, yeah, keep the chain going. Mm. That's right. Um, and these, these are, I mean, these are the, the, the cool thing about that is it's not motivated by an extrinsic reward. Um, uh, this is, I, I'm, I'm not super keen on the term gamification, even though um, I'm referred to as a gamification expert. That's why and, I kind of said it with trepidation uh, yeah, before. Yeah, yeah, you, you did very well. You did very well. It's a, it, look, it's maturing rapidly, but there are a lot of... Um, there's a lot of crappy gamification out there that's done in a way that looks good but doesn't really, doesn't really work from a motivation perspective, at least not sustainably. And a lot of that, de- that, a lot of that relies on rewards or incentivizing behavior. But that example you used before about Lyft... Uh, the app, which essentially is just a, a, a ritual for checking in to particular habits daily. It's in completely self-regulated. You can, you can fluff it up if you want and just pretend you're doing things, but no one's going to win or lose if you do that. Um, but if you actually use it properly and track daily habits or daily activities or actions and, um, 
then what you get is this sense of progress, which is inherently motivating. It's where the activity is the reward itself rather than relying on, you know, if I do, you know, if I manage to clear my inbox five days a week, at the end of the week I'm going to go out to dinner. You've just set up a very contingent-based thing and it might all be about, you know, going to dinner rather than the joy of processing through your stuff and staying on top of things. So, so how does that apply to games, though? Because obviously, you know, the whole idea of, in a traditional game sense, golf, basketball, football, it's mm-hmm. to win and the reward of winning, so to speak. It's like people obviously love to play the game, but yeah. you see them cross the finish line, it's like, well, only came, I came second or I lost the game. And there is a bit of disappointment there. They, they don't yeah. really internalise the joy of, hey, I, I, I played well and I fought well. And that's what you try and instill in your kids. But realistically, oh, let's just, be honest, oh, that yeah, doesn't yeah. happen. Yeah, um, there's two types of fun, really. Um, and this, this is an academic terms, and academics are very repressed people, so it's, it's kind of phallic. Um, it's, there's hard fun and soft fun in academic literature. Um, soft fun is, refers to activities like um, going to the movies, watching TV and things like that. Oh, that was fun, they say. Uh, whereas hard fun, if you look at people in the process of it, it doesn't look like they're having fun. It's frustrating. It's hard work. Um, uh, and yet it can bring a rich sense of satisfaction um, when you when you have when you reflect on the the work that's done, so hard fun. Um, another way to look at it is is tension plus release. Uh, in order to, mm. for there to be fun, there needs to be tension and then release. This just works with humour as well. So if you crack a politically incorrect joke and then you're not sure if it's going to land and then people laugh, like that actually contributes to a sense of fun. Um, so I've learned. Now, when it comes to sport, when it comes to sport, and I'm not I'm not the best at exam. You know, I. I've read a lot about sport, um, but I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not speaking from too much experience here. But um, if it was just about winning, um, then you can win easily. You just need to go into an easier game. You know, uh, if it's basketball, um, don't play at NBA level. Just go play at the local level and, you know, for your level of skill, um, then you could easily win. What people are instead striving for, and and you're right, there is disappointment when you don't achieve, but the thing that actually gets people engaged is this sense of, of engaging in something that's meaningful and challenging. So people, if you're doing really well in a particular sport, you'll get upgraded to a more challenging level of, of play. Mm-hmm. Just like if people are learning music, once they've mastered a piece, uh, they haven't won, it's not game over, uh, it's only game on. There's no real. There's no real success in a game like learning music. There's only progress. So you you master a particular piece, or at least to a level of competency, and then you move on to another piece. And it's always about seeking what is that challenge? How can we make this challenge the core part of the experience? And then when we are progressing through that, how do we make sure that the progress is visible or at least clear? I mean, with with music, you master a song, you can perform that song to people. With sport, you uh, you get skilled enough, you win. Some more games you might get upgraded to a different league all these things have progress mechanisms or or or, um ways that you can actually see your mastery built into the actual game itself and it's the challenge that people uh uh, that people really want to get out of these things more so than the reward the reward is secondary to the challenge no okay very cool so one thing you mentioned in, in in all of that and before was this gamification thing and how there's a lot of things that are seen as gamification that don't actually work. Can you talk yeah. about that? I, like, I think because a lot yeah. of people are familiar with gamification in terms of this buzzword and, and totally. uh, on the surface what it means, but to actually, you know, whether they're trying to do something for their own rights or they're trying to implement it in a product or course or something yeah. they're doing, what are some of these things that they would envisage a gamification things they're going to do but don't actually add any value? Yeah, yeah, that's that's perfect. I reckon, and it's it's a very hot topic for a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, it usually comes about when people are looking to enhance engagement in some way, whether it's with uh, customers or with people engaging with their product or service and things like that. In organisations, it works for employee engagement. Gamification, essentially, according to the very fluffy definition that came up, or fuzzy definition that came up, it, it essentially means the application of game-like mechanics in non-game contexts. There are other definitions going out there about game thinking, applying game thinking to things, but um, I've, I come from a background in academia and acad- academics are very brutal when it comes to definitions and no one really knows what game thinking is. So that then, uh, academics love to define definitions and the methodologies of defining definitions and we could go on forever there. But if we look at the term gamification, um, 
Gartner, um, who is a big technological um, firm, they have this um, Gartner hype cycle, um, this international kind of map of all the trends. Um, in about 2011, um, gamification was rising up on what they call the peak of inflated expectations. And the Gartner predicted by 2014, this year, uh, over 70% of organisations will have at least one gamified Apple process. Now, this was like a, a rallying horn for, is it, is it like the web 2.0 day? It's yeah. like pretty much anyone and everyone could call themselves a gamification expert. Uh, and there are all sorts of upjump gurus that came out of the woodwork promising all sorts of stuff. And I, I reckon the people at Gartner about six months later, I thought, oh, crap, what have we, what have we, what have we unleashed what have we here? Um, so about a year later after that first prediction, Gartner said, by 2014, 80% of current gamified apps uh, and processes will fail due to poor design, um, which I thought was a very good save, good cover for them. Uh, and it's also very, it's, it's very true. A lot of them will fail due to poor design. And the reasons are is that people will often put the game before the player. They'll get so excited about the game mechanics that they'll, they'll, they, they forget about what the actual core purpose is. In most of the things that work very well for getting people engaged, you just want to, you just want to minimize as, as much stuff that gets in between where they are and where they want to be, whether that's engaging in your service or, um, or, uh, or moving through a, uh, levels of engagement in a member community. What, what's, what's happened sometimes is uh, people have been inspired by what can work in games and at a very superficial level have implanted game-like things like leaderboards, point systems, badges and things like that into other contexts out of the blue and then tried to incentivize particular behaviors um, that don't really, that aren't really aligned to someone's inherent motivation. So these are the examples like... Um, Review my book and you'll earn 100 points. And if you earn 1,000 points, you level up and then you unlock a 5% discount on your next visit. Or, you know, it's just, it's just putting, it's just the horse before the yeah. cart before the horse stuff. Um, and, and a lot of it starts to get very inauthentic as well, um, which is the other trouble with, with uh, what I'm seeing with a lot of gamification. Uh, look at like typical loyalty programs. Um, now, if you've ever gone to a cafe that has a loyalty card where, you, you know, you get your 10th coffee free, yep. uh, that's kind of cool. Um, but what's more important than that is actually building loyalty by making really, really good coffee and, uh, and doing little things like remembering people's names or asking how they are and, and all those things. And sometimes we can jump to these structures and think, ah, oh, this will inspire loyalty, but really what you get is potentially the continuity of purchase and not real true loyalty. Uh, so I see things like that happen, and usually the biggest, uh, the biggest buzzwords that seem to indicate things are getting off track is when people start talking about uh, competitions uh, and rewards, mm -hmm. mainly because uh, competitions, um, it's, they're very tricky to actually do well. You've got a very limited chance for people to actually win things out of it, and they're usually only participating in the activity for the hope of winning whatever the reward is. And rewards, when if they're shiny enough, they'll actually detract from the inherent motivation of the activity. And what we, what we want to do is decontaminate these processes and actually make the work inherently motivating, make it easy for people to actually, actually have fun doing whatever it is that they do, uh, rather than jumping to rewards. I hope I'm making sense here. Well, yeah, absolutely. I want to ask you some, some sort of, I guess, ground level application of this. Sure. I know a lot of people who listen to the show here are familiar with Ed Dale and his challenge that's been yeah, going yeah, for yeah. seven or eight years now. And cool. this year's challenge or the, the previous 12 months challenge that, that they ran was the, the biggest and the most engaged based on video views and participation yeah. and stick with people going through the, the challenge program that's itself, right. which is completely free. Challenge.co is where you can find it. And I know you had uh, some input. Um, into the, the redesign of the challenge in terms of how they did make that stick because they did gamify, uh, for want of a better term, the challenge this year, which was the first one they've really done that. Yeah. Um, and the whole idea is to, was fundamentally to get people to consume more of the program and get to the end and actually achieve the goal totally. of pu you know, publishing and, and producing some content. Whereas 
in the past, there was a huge hockey stick or a negative hockey stick type approach, whereas yeah. what, you, what we found, and I was involved on, on and off over various years, is that, you know, the first, you know, three or four days, huge engagement. People would stick around, they'd watch the videos, they'd take, you know, the actions yeah. and move forward. But over, obviously, you know, the, the three or four-week period, um, the challenge changed shape a little bit over the years. But over the period of, of delivery, you know, engagement dropped off significantly. People didn't yeah. follow through. Whereas this year, they made some changes to, um, uh, I guess, deal with that. I know you had a lot of input and, and, and strategy advice for Ed and the team on that. And I think for a lot of people who have like some sort of program, coaching program, course, whatever it might be, you know, they probably find some ground level sort of ideas of what was implemented in the challenge and in similar places that worked really well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm thoroughly honoured that it seems like I had a big input in that. Um, I, I caught up with Ed actually just recently for a coffee, and uh, it's it's fab. I, I think I may have inspired some things, but I, I didn't actually have a lot of work take the credit, uh, behind mate. Come the scenes. Take the credit. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, but, it's not 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 good looking or, or not that smart. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, but it's brilliant what's been done. Now, I, I, when I had a chat with Ed, um, he was saying how, like, you know, on the whole, engagement just went up tr- dramatically. But he also realised, like, in, in, in the process, there are th- a lot of things that you'd do differently next time. And and this potentially is an approach that, that, that mirrors up what I'm trying to talk about in the game changer. It's a very experimental approach. It's, it's yeah, game designers would call it play testing. Um, scientists would call it conducting experiments. And so you could see this, this most recent challenge is a big experiment in which lots of different game mechanics were added. Um, now with all of these things and for anyone running a coaching program, uh, it's inevitable that you're going to encounter the law of unintended consequences where any well-intended thing that you do, so you might want to encourage more participation on the forums so you recognise that somehow. Well, and then what happens? points, that kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you it? get people spam with all these like short you know, comments um, and clog up the things like that just in an attempt to get points. Now, inevitably, there are going to be people that are going to gain the system. The good design comes through where you actually start thinking, how, or how, how, how could this little um, mechanic that I'm going to introduce possibly be gamed? The closer you go to quantified mechanics, the more likely you are to get think people like hacking the game or playing the game system. So at the simplest level, if you've got a coaching program, it, it can be, um, it comes back to providing visibility of progress. If you've got particular challenges that you uh, would like people to do or to get through. Uh, Watch a video, how, download it, a report, that kind well, of thing. Well, yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't really call them a challenge so much. Um, I mean, watching a video, down the report, download the report might help in a bigger challenge, like a, it, a challenge. It would lead to you learning how to do the actual action, exactly. which is the, the challenge itself. Yep. Exactly. So you might have uh, the challenge might be, all right, everyone's going I'm, to, I'm, I'm not, let's just choose something generic for coaching programs. Say it's going to be, say you've got a coaching program to help people write a book. Yep. Uh, cool. And the challenge might be, all right, everyone, you know, in two weeks' time, we're all going to have our, um, a draft contents page uploaded um, and here's some videos on how you can go about structuring the book different ways and stuff like that and then so the big challenge is uploading the, uh, uploading that now in a, in a poorly designed thing what that could look like is just email me your um, table of contents is or or just to upload them or something but what you can build in is some sort of um, here's, here's where a badging technique can work because it's a legitimate challenge and a badge you know, badges came from scouts and girl guides and things like that. They were really cool at one stage. I think they were. But um, they've, been, they've been used in some gamification contexts as a reward, whereas if you use them instead as something that acknowledges achievement, uh, almost something that's delivered after the event, then they become a good indicators as to who, done, who has done what. And people are more likely to be motivated to invest effort into the next challenge because they know that effort doesn't ap- disappear into a void. It has some recognition around it. So and actually, in, inside the members area or whatever it might be, you actually say, okay, once someone's actually submitted their uh, chapter contents document, they then have a, a little badge next to their name that sort of shows this person has done the first step. Yeah, and I mean, already I'm, I'm thinking like it, there's so many caveats to this. It really depends on the vibe of what you're doing and, and, and all that. Um, and this, this kind of goes like 
I, I'm, there is, there are far too many templates and rules and, and things out there. Like just, let's always keep thinking throughout this as to what's going to best serve, what's most aligned. But if you have a system where if people are, if, if they're engaging in challenges, now let, let's look at what happens in a video game, uh, particularly a role playing game. The bigger the challenge that you, uh, engage in, the more likely you are to get experience points. You get more experience points for the, the greater the challenge. So the more outside of your comfort zone you step, uh, if you successfully complete the challenges, you get more experience points, which help you level up. That same philosophy done without so much, um, engineering of rules and things like that. But if we just think, okay, great. If we're going to have some people engage in this challenge and some people are going to go and do really, really well, what's, what's a way that we can make sure that their, their, uh, activities are actually, uh, recognized? What's some way that we can enhance the visibility of their progress? Um, I've seen people run coaching programs, uh, very, very lean where it's 12 people on a webinar. Uh, where what they do instead of building in some sort of system into their program with gamification, coding, and all the background, in the webinar they just make sure at the start of the webinar they they highlight other people's achievements. So if you're running a program, you've got a dozen people on board, you know that eight of them have um, submitted a, you know, their table of context to the next bit and you know a couple have even gone even further. Making a real point to get that visible and, and highlighting that um, can make a huge difference because uh, – we, we are all intelligently lazy in the sense that um, conservation of effort is, I mean, laziness could be seen as, as, as a really good um, a gift, you know, in some regards, because it protects us from investing effort in things that would otherwise not contribute to progress. When you make it really clear how things contribute to progress and really up the visibility of that, people are a lot more likely to invest effort into it. Now, this, this correlates, didn't stop me at any time, but this correlates to some fascinating research around uh, depression as well. And depression is an absolute bitch. Um, mm. But what, there's an evolutionary uh, scientist who, uh, Dr. Randolph uh, Nesk, I think, I can't remember exactly. He, he argues that uh, depression may be an adaptive mechanism to protect us from blind optimism. And this is what can sometimes happen when we're so focused on big, hairy, audacious goals and we forget to celebrate the small wins along the way. What our, our systems can almost shut down and, and rather than invest stuff in our effort, our limited effort that we have each day into something that doesn't even seem to work, uh, we instead just preserve that and almost go into this, this, this low-level energy state. Um, laziness is kind of like a healthier version of that. Uh, and if we want to hack laziness, we need to make sure that uh, we know that if we're going to invest the effort into something, it's it's going to contribute to a sense of progress. And that's where the visibility piece really comes through. And it's something that um, you can really incorporate very well with simple, simple hacks um, into any platform or even just, just a good acknowledgement on, on a webinar. So taking this to sort of a bit more of an obscure angle, like can like this gamif gamification um, or, you know, game metrics work in anything. Like, let's say, for example, you're promoting a book, mm -hmm. uh, hypothetically. You have a yeah. book coming out. Yeah. How can you use the, you know, game metrics and, and game theory to increase purchases, hand-on referrals, people socially sharing bits of the book? Like, how can you use game theory to get to people to do that where it's not really like a continual thing. There's not really a little society that exists of the book readers where you can promote the badges and stuff like that. How, how can you do, use things like that in, in obscure one-off promotions or campaigns? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm writing it at the moment. And if you were to ask me this question in about six months' time, I might have some more wise <laughs> answers. We'll see how we go. Um, there, What's the plan, though? Do you have some plans? Well, there, there are a number of things like um, – like even before then, uh, I just want to slip this in because it was really helpful for me in the writing of the book. Anything that visualize, visualizes progress around that is great. I use a website called 750words.com initially to get me in the habit of writing, which is just something that tracks every day to make sure that you write at least 750 words. Mm -hmm. That's all it is, much like Lyft. Awesome. Um, and then there's other apps that allow you to set little daily targets and sprints and things like that that allow you to almost build your own little mini game of, you know, here's the challenge, I'm going to write 2,000 words in the next two hours, and you just, bam, game on, you write. But now that the book is done and it's got to get out there, um, I, I, the worst things that I could do, I think, um, not the worst things, but stuff that I think would be very tacky and um, reminiscent of stuff that I, I consider to be the more 
the poorer elements of game uh, gamification would be to make um, book promotion um, something to put the game before people's actual wishes. So if if I said something like uh, I don't look. I don't even have a system. What I'm what I'm doing here, instead of giving out points and having some sort of thing like that, I'm using a, a, a game thing. Um, have you ever heard of the game mechanic called Easter eggs? Uh, in terms of like putting little hidden gems inside yeah. something that people who kind of are aware of it or stumble across and go, "Oh, I've got something really cool." That's exactly yep. it. Combine that with something that's a very, very powerful um, mechanic in, in a lot of role-playing games, and it's the same thing that uh, poker machines use, which is the variable reward ratio, where uh, people know that um, if they, as long as they participate in playing, they're going to get some sort of reward eventually. They don't know what it is, though. Um, I'm trying to combine both of those in a real-world organic form, and what I've done is um, I've got pre-orders at the moment. Um, the book, I don't have the full stock yet, that comes in about a week or so, uh, but I've, I've, I've said that anyone who orders it through my website, I'm going to draw a random picture in the cover. I might draw a random picture in the cover, and they don't know what it's going to be a picture of, but it could be anything from, because uh, I illustrated the book as well, you see, uh, it could be anything from all sorts of random things, like a unicorn potato to a dolphin pirate contemplating the ethical rights of grapefruit to... Uh, you know, a, a rock that is actually sentient and a secret, um, you know, ninja clan member, you know, all, all sorts of things. And um, that seems to have generated a fair bit of excitement to, as to what they may get. But what's happening next with that, and it's something I'm toying with, and please, please, listener, everyone who's listening to this, don't don't even don't even think that I'm an expert in this because this is my first time uh, launching a book like this, and there's this 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 terrible irony of expertise happening right here. Where um, I, I've never worked on a book launch with anyone else before, and it's just this. It's actually kind of uh, it's kind of a bit of uh, it's this nervous kind of playtesting thing. I have no idea how it works, but. Um, I'm detached enough to know it's it's a it's a you know you know gamers spend eighty percent of their time failing by the way, dying and then starting again. Yeah, dying, starting again. That was resetting. me with Mario Brothers, mate. I yeah, that's right. Just to save that princess. Exactly. I feel that that uh, that the PR and the promotion of this book is going to be eighty percent of me dying, uh, and sometimes getting some wins. Um, so the next thing that happens is these books and. Uh, this is it's one of the stupidest things too. Um, be careful of what you uh, be careful of your marketing strategies because sometimes they can work so well they backfire. So I've got um, it's only been about f uh, five days since I announced this. I've got hundreds and hundreds of pre-orders now, which means I have to draw hundreds <laughs> and hundreds of things, which uh, yeah, which which is going to take a while. Um, I'm going to try draw them in sets. So there's going to be a um, like possibly a pirate-themed one, a ninja-themed one, robot-themed one, unicorn-themed one, all sorts of kind of little sets. And they'll ha probably have three types of characters in each set. We'll see how how tired I get drawing all these pictures. It could get incredibly random. I'm trying, I'm trying to make sure they don't get phallic at all because it's, you know, it's going out to families and whatnot. But, yes. you know, it could get all sorts of random. Um, but then what's going to happen out of that is is there's going to be some sort of encouragement that if you happen to find um, the uh, other two elements of the set, and that could be done in any way, and a lot of people are ordering group orders, if they happen to find it, um, then I will be doing a custom um, uh, card-mounted uh, illustration of the three people who match up their set. Yeah. I don't expect many people will actually get to this point but it's another layer that has the mystery and intrigue and what what it what it also taps into potentially is this completionist bias that um that we we often that that often manifests in day-to-day -day life if you've got if you're 80 percent of the way through a task um you're more likely to invest the energy for the last 20 percent um linkedin did this with their profile completion stuff and this is an, again if you're running any online course or you have you manage members uh, you can take huge inspiration from this uh, you know when sometimes you have membership communities and there's a sea of blank faces because no one's uploaded their photo to the yep. community 
uh, well, what LinkedIn did, they had that problem. Um, and so all they did was they simply put a percentage of profile completion. This is this was done a, a while ago now. Uh, percentage of profile completed. Add a photo, add an extra 30% to your profile completedness. Add a background, that's another 20%. And it gave a progress bar. And people started adding up their things because they, they couldn't stand the concept of having an incomplete profile. And as they added stuff, the feedback was immediate. You could see how the percentage went up. And this, this bias towards completion is something that we can use and work with. Um, it happens to me when I, whenever there's a, only one Tim Tam left in the packet in the fridge, you know, um, I cannot, I cannot not, you know, have that progress bar unfinished. Um, and, uh, and so, and so, there is a hope at some level uh, that that may happen, but I'm, I'm also done that. I mean, this is an afterthought uh, to the drawing in the book. I've done it in a way that it protects myself from an excessive amount of effort should, um, yeah, it's, it's hard enough that it might will probably not manifest, but intriguing enough that some people might be inclined to share the book on mm. uh, and, and the drawing that happened in their cover. What would be really interesting to see is, like, just thinking there about consumption and progress is, you know, obviously when you read a book on Kindle, you have that almost that like progress bar at the bottom of the yeah. of the, the Kindle or the, the iPad, whereas in a traditional printed book you don't have that. And it'd be really interesting mm. to see, like, if people get to 80% of that progress bar on a Kindle book, do what percentage of people actually end up finishing the book? Like, is that actually affecting consumption in terms of books and things as well? That would be really interesting to see because it you, would know, be. then you can sort of manufacture a printed version of that sort of scroll bar at the bottom of every page of a printed book. And so that kind of visual <laughs> yeah. helps sort of tip people yeah, over exactly. the Yeah, exactly. I mean, I guess people are going to know roughly like where their thumb is and how, it, how, how, yeah, that's right. Thickness. But, um, and, and books are a funny thing um, because a lot of books, like a lot of the value is heavily skewed to the front. Like if you're looking for the big why, like that aha moment, it's probably going to be delivered in the first um, third of the book. And then the, the, the rest of it's kind of, it, with, with a lot of books, kind of moves into more implementation stuff. Like it moves from why, what, how, yep. pretty much. And um, so it, it wouldn't surprise me if people are jumping non-linear, like in a non-linear way. Like I'm, I'm pretty excited about the future of books and with this game design context and things like that, um, there's been some pretty, like this is a tangent, of course, um, some pretty fascinating, uh, you know, visualizations and, uh, little mock-ups of what the future of reading could be like and you can almost imagine like I, you, you can almost imagine you start off and there's these different worlds that you can kind of visit where the infinite yeah, oh, I'm getting a bit carried away here but anyway yes the progress bar I, I think geez there, there's this wonderful movie um called Sight. It's this movie I think you can find it on Vimeo Sight like visual vision you know yep. what you see and it has this disturbing view of the future it's really fascinating and disturbing by equal measure if we look at the current trends of technology where we're shifting to wearable technology and after that will become even more wearable like contact lenses um, i did some work with uh, researchers uh, at one of the big universities here and they're already talking about embedded technology that can intervene for your health you know and sync with your smartphone and, and all sorts of things and that's the that's the pathway we're going to imagine if we had a heads up display that was very much like a game. Um, so this, can I just go a bit crazy? Absolutely, here? Cause go for just, it. Um, cause we talk about, um, keeping, keeping our goals, uh, visual and, and, and primary. So if we are, if there are important things for us to do, mission critical goals or we're in the quarter and you, we got them there. If, if you look at a role playing game, you've got your current active quest visible. You know what the objectives and milestones are slay three boars, pick ten flowers or whatever it is, or something more complex if you're a higher level. Unfortunately, we don't have that in the real world. And a lot of our goals and good intentions remain hidden and we'll find ourselves defaulting to the more progress-rich activities like checking email instead of um, chipping away at, at the, the bigger important things. Imagine, the, the, you know, I, I don't think, I think it will be within our lifetime where we get to experience, it might be Google Glass or the equivalent or something like that, where we can walk around and almost like I have a heads up display, we can have our um, current health, energy levels, nutrition, uh, all that. It's just, it's just all, if we look at the trend of, yeah, the quantified self, it's just giving yourself immediate visual feedback as to what's happening in your body and, and what's also important. 
and that will help to keep you aligned. And as you achieve through this stuff, you get to see it visibly tick off the things on your list. I mean, we don't have to wait to that, of course. We can carry around a notebook or a journal and we can use some clever, la clever apps like Lyft and the other things that we can do. But I think there's going to be a way where these feedback loops are going to be short-circuited even further. And if we just start thinking about this mindset now and, you know, looking at any of this work and seeing is that, you know, work is already a game. I should probably share the definition of a game, by the way. Oh, <laughs> for sure, absolutely. <laughs> um, so all games, sports games, video games, board games, all games are simply the interplay of goals, rules, and feedback. A good game is a goal-driven, challenge-intense, and feedback-rich experience geared towards making progress. So I mentioned before that there's been an overemphasis over in the past on goals, and the big overlooked thing has been this clear sense of progress, the feedback mechanism. Goals, rules, feedback. Rules are what calibrate the level of challenge and give us clarity about what we can and cannot do. If we look at this definition of goals, rules, feedback, any project could be considered a game. Projects have goals, they have objectives, they have rules, they have like the amount of budget and time that you have. And they have feedback as to whether the project succeeded or failed and how, whether the project's on track. This same definition of games can also be applied to very mundane things like um, driving to work. You've got the goal to get the work alive or on time. Uh, there are rules like the, the, the speed, you know, the legal speed limits and all sorts of things. And there's feedback as to whether you're on track or whether, you, whether you're progressing there. You've got milestones that you can use to get, get a sense of the whether you, you're winning your game. And then it can extend to even making a cup of tea. You know, your goal is to make a good cup of tea. The rules are leave it in for a certain amount of time and yeah. put milk if you have that. And the feedback is it is a good cup of tea. Cooking a meal, reading a book, that everything in life is a game, right? But if something's not working, it's usually that there's something wrong with uh, or something that could be tweaked with the goals. It might be that the goal is too big or too, too far into the future and needs to be chunked down. It might be the rules are, are inherited and archaic and don't serve the actual purpose of it. And the feedback might be too, you know, not in, the, not in a useful format or too delayed or all sorts of things. And taking this, this approach of seeing everything as a game and if something's not working, rather than questioning someone's attitude or their motivation, just stepping back and thinking, okay, what's going on in the game here? Like, do we know what we want to achieve or what's getting in the way? That is what's going to liberate so much. Um, so that's, what, that's what's going to help us when it comes to cha uh, motivation, behavior cha challenges, whether it's in our own life or whether it's in people engaging with our stuff. Very cool, man. And that's basically what the book's all about, isn't it? So who, who is the book for in terms of people listen to us cover a lot of, of great stuff? And they'll be like, well, hang on, is, is the book for me? Can you kind of, we haven't really talked about the game changer in its actual context much. Can you sort of explain exactly what the book covers, who it's for, what they're going to get out of reading it? Sure. Um, anyone working with people are going to get a lot of benefit out of this, particularly if you're wanting to drive change. Um, it's, uh, I've got clients that range from senior execs in multinational organisations through to uh, people running fairly lean startups. And in all of these areas, change is one of those tricky things. Startups usually have a pretty good approach if they're using an agile approach. Um, but in organizations, change is bloody hard. And what, what this book does is it gives people a new way, a new approach to actually manage the motivation through change. So inevitably, I found myself through the writing of the book writing for an individual because even if you are a leader in a large organization, you're still an individual and it's still worth you understanding your own motivation before you attempt to influence the motivation of others. And the avenue that I present in this book, um, you know, the, the classic motivational approach is to work on attitudes and beliefs. And I think that's that can lead to a lot of problems be, unless you're a very, very sophisticated coach. And don't get me wrong, this stuff can be transformational if you know what you're doing. Uh, but it's very, very hard to scale. And so sometimes you get these one-size-fits-all motivational messages that don't really correlate to people and don't really work uh, in, in a bigger context and can sometimes be damaging. The second approach is the classic managerial approach, which relies on incentives, recognition, and reward schemes. And these work tremendously well. So in organisations, um, sales teams that are motivated by commissions or uh, if, you're, if you're managing a small team, uh, setting up a reward based upon particular activities, it actually works incredibly well. The danger is sometimes you can get people so focused on achieving that reward that the other more important things that are hard to define, they actually start to slip by. Like imagine a context where... Um, 
you've got someone who's a, a, a teacher, for example, in, in a school, and they do amazing work and the kids love it. She's innovative in the classroom and she shares resources with other teachers. They all love it. And then this new whippersnapper principal sees that and thinks, I want to get more of that happening in this school. So they offer a $10,000 bonus to the top 10% of teachers. Now, that's a wonderful intention, but what may happen is this reward may get teachers who would naturally share their resources. They may think, actually, you know, what if I share this? I might not be in the top 10%, so I might keep this one to myself. And people that might um, might be inclined to innovate in the classroom and do stuff that's creative and out of the box, they might rein that back in and just do things that might get recognised within the context of the reward. And so this well-intended, uh, very competitive mechanic of a reward dropped into a collaborative environment can influence behaviour in a way that's not really conducive to good progress. And it's that type of awareness of moving beyond incentives and rewards because they do work, they work incredibly well to focus behaviour, but the work that we're moving towards, the future of work, it requires much more collaboration, much more creativity and agility. And it's hard to actually box in to define, especially if it's unprecedented work or pioneering work. And that's where I hope through the book I present a third perspective, and that is to change the game, to make work inherently motivating and to look at any task, any process that you've got through to the lens of game design to see the goals, rules and feedback. And, you know, with a good understanding of motivation, science and reason, be able to make tweaks to the game at play to to, to almost find the game changer, that, the game, that, 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 that element that will that'll make a significant difference to the game at play and to really focus on making the process inherently motivating before we just default to incentives and rewards and before we try to um, pump people up with individual coaching. Beautiful. Yeah. Perfect. That's, Love it. That's, that's, what it's, that's what it's about. Well, I, I highly recommend it. I've had a, a read of it and I found it really engaging, particularly um, the tactic or the strategy of rubber ducking. I thought that was very, very cool. Um, oh, yes. We won't go into it. We'll leave that for the people sure. to, uh, to pick up a copy. Oh, mystery. And, yes, well uh, done. Good work. Definitely check that out. I think in its own right, that in its own little takeaway is definitely worth the price of admission because I think um, that's really cool. Oh, cool. Thanks. So um, one final question, Jason, that I ask every single guest we have on the show here, yep. and that is what is the one question that I haven't asked you that I probably should have? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, the one question that you haven't asked that you probably should have. Wow, you've done uh, you've done really well, and thank you for the flexibility of um, being, for allowing me to go on my rambles. Um, so it's all about here on Preneurcast, mate. We <laughs> we've covered the gamification thing, which is good. Um, I think he, he, there's there's one thing that I, I just want to reemphasize here because, um, and that, that might be the question that early on in the book. I talk about how uh, deliberately this is um, this is not a book that will dumb things down to a simple set of tips. Uh, I actually want to provoke deeper thinking through this. I want actually people to think about motivation because uh, so far we've been lulled into uh, into almost very simple ways to handle motivation. Oh, it must be this, or you need to have a goal, or you need to have a vision, it needs to be smart and all these things. Sometimes the world of motivation and the interactions of human behaviour are a bit more complex. So there's this great quote that I pulled from, and I'm just looking at the book now because I, the name's just eluding me, um, where the guy says, if, uh, if you want people to, uh, oh, here we are, I can't really, there we go, all right, it's gone from me, but it's essentially if you want, um, if you want uh, people to think, share your intent, not your instructions. And so rather than simply dumbing this down to instructions or a list of things to do or follow, I hope that this is a book that gets people to think a little bit differently about motivation. Even if you're not, you're not cool with this whole concept of seeing, uh, seeing you know, life as an infinite game that consists of all these little games, even if that doesn't sit too well with you, at least play with that idea. At least try to, to, to look at things as, as though it were a game. And if you're listening to this podcast right now, I don't know what your next activity is. You might be going for a run. You might be getting back to emails. You might be working on another report. Uh, whatever it is, just just play with this concept for for that next activity. Think think about what is the current game right now. Maybe set yourself a time parameter to achieve a particular task within a certain time frame. Make sure the feedback is going to be visible and clear, and give it a go. 
and just stay curious with how you actually act in that. Um, if you if you didn't succeed, maybe the challenge was too high and it could be calibrated for next time. If you got disengaged or disinterested, maybe the challenge wasn't high enough and that could be shifted. Uh, maybe you need to work with other people. It's, it's that type of mindset that I want to get you into, uh, just to be um, wonderfully curious about your own motivation and behaviour and then extend that curiosity to the world around you. Love it. And David Marquette was the person who said, if you want people to Perfect. think, give them intent, not instruction. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, legendary quote. Beautiful, mate. Well, again, thank you very much for your time. The book is The Game Changer. Dr. Jason Fox, appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, mate. That's excellent. Cheers, mate. So I still can't believe that you actually talked about his beard straight out. <laughs> well, mate, it is that good. It is seriously the best beard in marketing. It's awesome. <laughs> It, yeah, folks, folks, like, not not just to give him the credit of the, the extra traffic to his website, but do go and check out the link to, to Dr. Fox's website in the show notes. Go and, go and just check it out the, on the about, about, about Jason's uh, page. It's just amazing. <laughs> but, but please, I don't want to detract from the stuff that I got from that. I literally have gone back and listened to it again. Um, it it's really was the links i was i was seeing links to a lot of the stuff that we've already talked about he talks about things like entrepreneurs startups you know the things in there in my mind i was linking stuff he was talking to to you know really back into things like the lean startup you know a book i talk about a lot um but it, it, i think the biggest thing for me i'm going to pull this one out the biggest thing for me was when he said because all this stuff does come from actual game the, this concept of the game theory or you know what how games work and he said that if you actually look at people who play games like video games or whatever they fail 80 percent of the time mm. and i think if if, you, if anybody takes anything away from that it is that it's like you you fail failure is not the opposite of success was what he said wasn't it mm -hmm. failure is not the opposite of success I think he's actually said apathy is the opposite of success. <laughs> you know, failure is a, is a path to learning, and absolutely, you know, we've said this before on the show, but it was really great to hear his perspective on that and just all all those other things. Um, it really changed my mind about this this term gamification or game theory or whatever you want to call it. Um, and do do recommend the book. Definitely recommend reading the book uh, because there's a lot of stuff for anybody in any kind of business, whether you're dealing with clients. Or dealing with your own internal team, or even yourself, as mm -hmm. some of the examples you gave. Absolutely. So, speaking of the book, we, the lovely people at Wiley Publishing, have uh, given us uh, three copies to give away to the community. So, if you are interested in grabbing a copy of Jason's Fo Jason Bo Jason Fox's book, let me get that right. I would suggest going and buying it on uh, Amazon or Kindle or Booktopia or, or some sort of place, and then try and win one for a friend. That's my suggestion, obviously. Uh, but to win a copy of Jason's book, all you have to do is head over to preneurmarketing.com, the home of the show, the home of the community, and leave a comment at the bottom of this episode's post. So let us know the biggest takeaway you got, what you thought of his beard, uh, how you were going to apply some of this stuff in your business, uh, your favorite quote from the conversation. Mine was, I've read a lot about sport. I thought that was quite an amusing comment that he made. But head over to <laughs> preneurmarketing.com, find the blog post for this particular episode and leave a comment uh, on the show. We'll, uh, we'll keep that going from two weeks from the day that this episode airs. So you'll have two weeks of this, this episode and then the next episode um, of period of time to enter. So you've got a chance to listen to the show, leave a comment, uh, what your biggest takeaway was, what you loved about it, how you're going to apply it, a similar book you read that you think is worth reading or noting, anything that relates to this particular episode. So go there and we'll, uh, we'll announce the winners of uh, three books that we'll uh, send your way to hopefully give to a friend because you've already bought Jason's book. That, that is a, actually a great tip um, because we love to share our knowledge and we love to share our tips about the books. And one of the things, you know, I actually don't like giving people my copy of a book. Um, so um, I've been known to buy one for my friends as well. So, yeah, if you can win one and give it away, away you go. And, folks, while you're on preneurmarketing.com, if you're not already a member of the Preneur community, on our, you know, if you haven't... Uh, on our mailing list and, and aren't already receiving things like noise reduction, our weekly tips about uh, cool and interesting things out there, 
um, do sign up because the other thing you can do when you do that is that you can download a copy of Pete's audio book, mm. uh, which you did mention, actually. You did mention in the interview. Well, it was my first book with Whiteley, the same publishing team that uh, Jason used. So we have the rights back to that book now, which is super exciting. It was part of the negotiation that my agent uh, factored in, which was uh, really fantastic, that we can now um, you know, give away the audio version of that book. So it is available right now. You can go and uh, get it at preneurmarketing.com right at the top of the page or at the bottom of the page. There's a, a box where you can put in your name and your email, and we will send you that audio version. So you can throw it on your iPad or on your iPod, on your Android, and listen to it uh, between podcast episodes if you really uh, miss hearing the stuff we share. Excellent, excellent. So on that, folks, as it was a little bit of a a longer than usual interview, uh, but definitely incredibly valuable, um, let's wrap up. Pete, what are we doing next week? Uh, We're going to talk about um, my VD report. That sounds unfortunate. Mm. No, basically it's a a report that's (laughs) available on the website. Uh, the the Venn diagram report, the VD report, it's just all about increasing your website conversion. So if you've got a website and as part of your seven levers, you are trying to increase the conversions that generates, whether that's phone calls, uh, whether that's uh, people inquiring uh, about a request to quote for a service you offer, whether it's actually them making a purchase through your e-com site. Obviously, I have different businesses that use the conversion lever uh, in numerous ways. We've got you know our telco business that is designed to actually generate uh, inquiries for phone system quotes. We've got itelecom.com.au, which is a new uh, business unit we've set up, which is an e-com site uh, around telco products, you know the phone system hardware and, and handsets and stuff, and obviously since Simply headsets and stuff like that. So we've, you know, been increasing the conversion rates of our income stores for a while, and then places like, um, you know, outsourceprofitmachine.com, which is the online um, information site for the outsourcing course. We've, we have a number of websites in our um, businesses that. Um, uh, re- require online conversions to, to generate the uh, revenue for the business. So uh, we've got a lot of stuff we can share in next week's episode, which is uh, my VD report. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's very schoolboy of me, but I just got a giggle. Okay, folks, on the, and on that, before I, I lose it completely, um, thanks for joining us this week. I hope you really enjoyed that interview, and uh, we'll see you next week. Not going to say bye? Uh, bye. You've been enjoying another fine episode of PreneurCast with Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at www.preneurmarketing.com or drop them a line via PreneurCast at PreneurGroup.com.